Love Sex Podcast. Yes, and we are excited. We hope y'all had a great uh, weekend last weekend. I hope you got more treats than you got tricks. Absolutely. <laughs> and that you you shared that sweet, sensational love that uh, that is possible when you strengthen love and sex. Uh-huh. And so we're back with a brand new podcast for you tonight and pray that um you all are ready to receive come on in come on in the room get you some get you a little glass of wine or some water or some hot cocoa because that cold front is coming isn't it? it really is seasons have changed it we're here we changed. are in november we made it to november it'll be christmas tomorrow <laughs> and so we are here tonight to talk about some soup how many of y'all like eating soup especially when it gets cold right some nice soup with a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> Something hot for the throat. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. Um, with the seasons changing as they are, there are some things that we have to do to change with the season. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things we do to change with the cold seasons? One, we have to change our wardrobe. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, we can no longer go out, especially if you live in a place that has all four seasons, then you have to dress according to this, the weather. You got to layer up. You got to put some more clothes on. I got my little sweat on today, you know, because it's a little nippy outside. But then, the, I like yours, thank man. you. I like yours too. Uh, and then there is this thing where we change our food. You know, like in the summertime, you're looking for ice cream, looking for something cold, some lemonade, something light. But in the fall and the winter, a little more hearty, something that's going to be more warming to your stomach, more filling. Like soup. So, I know y'all keep asking me, why is this man talking about soup and what does this have to do with strengthening love and sex? I'm glad you're so inquisitive because we're going to go to the scripture. I always believe in, in using scripture as a Christian, uh, as a foundation for me. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. And so I want to see what does this text have to say about what I want to talk to you about tonight. Genesis chapter 25. Okay. Um, it says, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights Hmm. as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He despised his rights as the firstborn. So what we got going on in this text, babe, is that uh, you have some twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. And Esau comes in from the field. He's been hunting all day. Hadn't caught anything, obviously, because he's hungry and he wants some of this stew. His brother conveniently is cooking some stew. <clears throat> Y'all know how it is when you're hungry, right? Can you smell that lentil stew? Oh, my God. It's, it's got carrots and potatoes and probably has some goat in it. Onions. Onions. It's been, it's been simmering for a while. The, the, the whiffs of smoke are dancing in the air and hit the nostrils of uh Esau and Esau's stomach is about to eat his shirt. He's famished. He's exhausted. And he says, bro, what you got cooking? Let me have some of that. And Jacob, being the trickster that he was, sees an opportunity and says, you can have some if you sell me your birthright. Now, pick up on that for a minute, babe, and tell me what you think, (laughs) what you think is going on in the mind of Jacob and Esau at that moment. Talk about that. Well, at the time, I think Esau is more concerned about his immediate need of hunger. I don't think he was famished, meaning he's dying of starvation or anything like that. But I do think he was hungry. And Jacob had an alternative motive for giving his brother Mm. some of this stew. Uh, really, there should not have been any exchange other than he's prepared this stew and he's going to let his brother have some. There should not have been an exchange of selling of the birthright. 
but that's another story for another day. So this guy has a, a legitimate need. Esau mm -hmm. has a legitimate need. He's hungry. He's been working all day. Comes home. He's hungry and he expects his brother to share with him. But his brother sees an opportunity to leverage a ask that he's been wanting to ask because watch this when they were born before they were born they were in their mother's womb and they were wrestling and and the angel speaks to the mother and says that there are two nations at war within you and the younger will serve the older esau is the older jacob is the younger and so jacob probably knows through his mother that he's deserving of this birthright so he thinks and so he tricks his brother into selling his birthright what does this have to do with Mary, folks? I'm glad you asked. Because as Esau and Jacob, they are kind of allegorically uh, a picture of a husband and wife. Okay. One's been outside working all day. Okay. Another one's managing the home. Okay. Traditional roles say that the man is the hunter and the woman is the one that manages the home. Now, we know that those roles are gender fluid now. Uh, and, you know, the woman might work outside and the man might be at home. But the point is, one person's outside and one person's inside. And the person on the inside is preparing a meal for the person who's been working on the outside. And they come home exhausted and starved. And the ideal thing is, baby, welcome home. I got something for you to eat. But what happens when a, one person is emotionally starved or physically starved? or sexually starved and the other person weaponizes what they need. Sometimes the other person that the one that is emotionally, sexually, mentally, physically starved, whatever the case may be, may give up something more than what is really intended. Because at that moment, they're vulnerable. At the very moment, yes, they are vulnerable. And if you really love somebody, it would seem that you would take note of that vulnerability and not take advantage of it. Absolutely. Right. But it happens, right? It does. Because when we weaponize sex and you recognize one person is in need of it, their love language might be touch mm -hmm. or their love language might be affirmation or their love language might be acts of service, whatever their love language is. And they're starving for that. What we don't need to do is to try to leverage it for our own selfish interests, to try to manipulate the other. But in, in so many marriages, there are a lot of sex starved and emotionally starved people who are not getting what they want. And that's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous combination to be exhausted and hungry. I don't think it's getting what you want. It's getting what the other person needs. Mm. So being if you're talking about the five love languages then that person depending on where they fall they need those things in order to be a complete person in that marriage mm -hmm. uh, a partner in that marriage so with this example of esau and jacob esau needed nourishment because he had been out all day in the field and jacob he didn't have a need. He had a want. Hmm. He wanted his brother's birthright. Wow. Well, was he going? Was Jacob going to get a birthright? He was. But here's here's the thing. This here's the thing that many of you might not know about the birthright. The birthright was the oldest sibling's entitlement that they would get a double portion of whatever the daddy left. Mm -hmm. Esau and Jacob were the only children but Esau was the oldest. He was going to get a double portion. But Jacob said, I'm not going to give you any soup unless you give me your double portion. Mm -hmm. And the immediacy of now superseded his ability to, to wait, to have delayed gratification. He wanted it right there. And sometimes in marriage and relationships, we exchange something very valuable for the immediacy of now. And sometimes if we're not careful, somebody else runs into your spouse while they're exhausted and hungry or horny. <laughs> and and, and it's, I read something the other day, baby said that never send your man away from home hungry or horny. Uh, a wife needs to feed her husband. We've always heard what? Uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. stomach. And so 
women need to make sure their men are fed. And I think the same is also true for men with women. Absolutely. You need to make sure you don't send your wife away hungry. Mm -hmm. Hungry for what? Hungry for food or for affection. Because there's somebody who is waiting at work with open arms and with a marks, remarks ready, compliments ready. Oh, you look nice today. You smell good today. And if you're leaving home sexually starved or emotionally starved, hmm. You know, they say you should never go to the grocery store hungry. Uh, no, you should not. Why is that? Because you buy, you you have in your mind all these things that you're going to prepare. You buy all this stuff, this food, and you don't use it. You waste it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You buy a bunch of stuff that you don't, that you had no intention of buying because your stomach is doing the dictation. And then you're spending more than you intended to spend as well. You're in there buying White Castles and pork skin rinds <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what happens in life too <clears throat> you end up getting into relationships and situations that are detrimental because you left the house hungry mm. he was supposed to give his brother some soup but he leveraged it to try to get his birthright and what's crazy is that esau agreed to the terms and he's like here you can have my birthright all he wanted was a bowl of soup but he ended up giving away his inheritance. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I was looking up uh, soup, right? This is stew that, that his brother had fixed. And, and the lentil stew consisted of some kind of meat-based soup, liquid soup that had vegetables and basil and all that kind of stuff in it. Um, but soup, I discovered, was also meant for restoration. Uh, the word restaurant that we use a lot, mm -hmm is really a word that originated in France in the 16th century to refer to a highly concentrated, inexpensive soup sold by street vendors that was advertised as an antidote to physical exhaustion. In 1765, a Parisian entrepreneur opened a shop specializing in such soups. This prompted the use of the modern word restaurant for the eating establishments. The word restaurant means to restore, which also is attached to the word soup because soup was believed to restore people from exhaustion. Mm -hmm. What is it in your relationship that restores the exhaustion in the other? Hmm. What is it, babe? It could be a hug. It could be a conversation. It can be sex. It could be anything that the other partner in the relationship needs, whether that's a deep conversation, uh, a need to get some things off each other's chest, mm -hmm. or it could be a good hearty meal. Yeah. His brother should have been sensitive to the fact that this man had been oh, out hunting. Yeah. I'm sure he was hunting for the family. Yeah. Right? He was making sure there was provision for the house. And Jacob, who was a homebody, was in essence managing what he brought in. And he should have been supportive in the sense that I know you're hungry, bro. Here, here's some soup. But instead, he takes advantage of his hunger. His brother Jacob should have been empathetic towards his hunger, but but instead wanted to manipulate his vulnerability by offering him soup in exchange for his birthright. How does this relate to marriage? Great question. There are a lot of people in sexually starved marriages. They are exhausted from working or hunting. They come home to spouses who want to weaponize nourishment and love. Uh, I'll give you some if you give me this. We should never have to barter for what we need in a marriage. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says do not deny one another from sexual fulfillment, um, not even for fasting and prayer. But if, you, if you're going to deny each other sex for fasting and prayer purposes, Paul says do that for a little while unless you give the devil a foothold. And whenever we are hungry or exhausted, the devil can take advantage of that. Even Jesus, when he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights by the devil, he came to him when he was hungry. Mm -hmm. The devil always shows up. What? When you're hungry. When you're hungry. So don't send your folk out hungry or horny. <laughs> Watch this. In her book, Science for Sexual Happiness, Catherine Jesse says that there's something called soup. She has an exercise when the sympathetic nervous system is triggered because of stress or exhaustion and our bodies tend to shut down, she has an exercise to help the parasympathetic kick in so that we open up and become sexually aroused. 
We can reliably engage the parasympathetic nervous system when we mix ingredients with the handy acronym of soup. Baby, can you break down for the people listening this soup that's necessary for a sexually fulfilled marriage? The S in soup stands for safety. So your relationship needs a place that is stress-free mm. and a place where your spouse can feel relaxed when they are in a safe and when they're in safe spaces, our parasympathetic nervous system is able to communicate to our bodies that it's okay to be sexually and romantically aroused, meaning that when you feel safe, mm. that you're more relaxed, your guards are down, um, you're more in tune with your spouse, uh, you're more sympathetic with your spouse you're more in tune with the, your spouse's needs so therefore sex can take place more that, readily. what does that look like for you as a woman what does a safe space look like to where you're like oh i want i want to be with my husband i i feel safe i i feel open what does that look like for you what's well, a whole picture safety is only one part of it but as far as feeling safe meaning there is no immediate danger gotcha um that there is no stress no stressors that everything is in line uh the kids are doing okay um there's minimal work that needs to be done at home uh, because there's help with the spouse. You both, depending on your love language, so you both are working inside the home to make sure dinner's prepared or chores are done. It's not on one person, mm -hmm. but just that whole feeling of cared for and safety and appreciated. You got to make sure that there's no stressors in your house. My wife has a sign on the on the bar in the kitchen that says, you're at home now, you can breathe. When you walk through the doors of your home, your home should feel like a safe space. Mm -hmm. There's no criticism. You've already probably been through some stress at work, trying to meet deadlines, trying to work through politics, trying to fight through racism. The last thing you need is to come home and have to have to feel like you got to fight right. or walk on eggshells. A safe home, a peaceful home is a loving home where you are like, OK, I can let my guards down. And that triggers the parasympathetic nervous system to say, OK, I can breathe. I can release some of this blood to my sexual organs. I can loosen my pelvic floor. I want some loving. Go ahead. It's almost like when we as women take our bra off and Blue. that <laughs> that feeling of freedom and not being constricted that is the feeling of safety mm. like i am safe i'm home i can let my girls out and mm -hmm. i'm good <laughs> and for men we can come home and i don't have to answer a bunch of questions i don't have to defend myself i'm good give me time to decompress let me go in there and sit and and go in my man cave and have a beer or watch tv or just relax a safe place that's the s in mm -hmm. soup what's the o sweetheart the o is openness mm. when you are aroused because you feel safe you're able to open up mm. you open up your heart so that you can emotionally be available to your spouse and that openness also helps create that loving warm feeling mm -hmm. of i'm letting my husband my spouse in yeah. so i'm not keeping anything from him i'm not keeping anything from her so being able to be open also helps in that space we need to spend a little time here okay because for men let me tell you what that means practically for for men many of us use up our words during the course of a day men use less words during the day than women do and a lot of times we run out of words by the end of the day but we have to be conscientious to reserve some of those words for our spouse for our wives because they want to know how was your day and don't do them like your teenagers do you it was good that is so lame they want to know details and as and as exhausting as it may seem from a male perspective that it's exhausting to go over the details. You want to just get to the cliff notes. 
women want to know details. And a lot of times when women talk to you, they're not talking for you to fix something. They're just talking for you to hear their heart. Right. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, and so to be open is we, we said this a lot. I said again that a lot of people don't have a problem getting naked physically. They have a problem getting naked emotionally. Mm -hmm. And openness is all about being emotionally naked to say, to describe your emotions, to name your emotions. Women, y'all got to help us men out now. We, when y'all, when we say, baby, what's wrong? And you say nothing. We can't do nothing with nothing, but we know it's something because you ain't saying nothing. <laughs> and so <laughs> you have to be open. Am I right? You're correct. You're correct. But I think many women use the scapegoat of the word nothing is because it's not going anywhere with your spouse. If you try to explain something to your, your husband, then they're going to try to fix it or they're going to try to mansplain it. So it's easier to say nothing because truly you may not feel safe with ex explaining what is going on at that particular moment, or you are in fear of it mushrooming into something that it doesn't need to mushroom into. So we ain't going to get no soup. We're just going to be hungry that night because ain't nobody going to be open. Well, no, you got to cook, so you got to eat. So it might be a sandwich. <laughs> so openness. Openness. Help, now, now, I agree with you that that's why some women do it, but move them to how do they get open and share their heart with their husband? There needs to be some really good groundwork done so that communication takes place so that each spouse, each person feels like they can be open with their spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't feel like they can, then trying different techniques on just a little bit of conversation, not giving the whole spill of the day, like not giving and not saying, oh, leaving open ended questions where you're just answering yes, no, fine, you know, one word where there's a little elaboration. Being more descriptive. You're being more descriptive, a little more elaboration, but just giving it a little bit at a time so that you're reteaching a good mm -hmm. habit so that you can get the communication that you so desire and your husband can give you the responses that you so desire. Here's the next ingredient of soup that's going to help bridge what my wife is saying, because there's some, as she said, in some relationships where there's gridlock, where a person like, I'm not going to share or be open because they're going to try to fix it or they're not going to hear me. Mm -hmm. So what's necessary then? What ingredient soup is necessary for that to happen? We got the safe space. Mm -hmm. We've got openness. Here's the you understanding. A lot of times when women are sharing with their husbands, it's not for you to fix it. It's for you to understand. If you can understand her heart and repeat back to her what you heard her say and have empathy for what she said, that makes her feel like, okay, I can remain open. Mm -hmm. But the moment you try to fix it or become defensive, that door shuts or say something like that makes no sense that logically makes no sense everything is not always logical <laughs> um in a woman's mind it it may be at the time logical you said it i didn't I, I did, I did. i'm sorry ladies but there are some things that may not be logical to a man but they're logical to the female brain like women, we can have we can have multiple conversations all at the same time, five different things. But we have to make sure that when we talk to our husbands, that we are very tunnel vision and stay on stay on task, stay on stay task, focus one stay thing focus at a time, one thing at a time. And and men, we have to show understanding, which requires empathy, putting yourself in her shoes. How did it feel when I snapped? at her when she asked me a question. Yes, I'm tired. Yes, I've been working all day. But was that the proper tone to use with my wife just because I'm frustrated at something that happened at work and I accidentally took it out on her? I can say I understand that my tone was abrasive 
and I apologize. I can understand how you would feel hurt by my tone. I didn't mean to take my frustrations out on you. Is that an acceptable apology? Mm, yes, it is. Mm, what's the, mm? the what's mm, the, mm? the sound effect is if it like how can I say this? If it really is honest, heartfelt, and it doesn't come after a, a whole litany of being berated or um, attitude. And the woman has to be open to receive the apology. You know, there's a shift that has to happen with the woman to say, okay, I see he's trying to apologize. And there has to be some open, some some fluidity between both of them in order for this uh, understanding You're to right. take place. You're right. It does. Uh, um, and, and a lot of times we tell people in counseling, it's better to seek to understand than to be understood. than it is to be understood. And if both spouses practice that, they're seeking to understand the other rather than trying to push their viewpoint Absolutely. on the other. So understanding is crucial. The last one in soup. Is what, sweetheart? It's pleasant touch. We finally get to the place where we get some soup. <laughs> <laughs> pleasant touch. Oh my God. Once your spouse is feeling safe, understood, and open, then and only then can you take them to a place of ecstasy through pleasurable touches. Yes. And we've talked about the erogenous zones. There's so many places to explore the neck, the breast, the hair. My wife. I asked you her. You don't other, need to. No, tell I, this that. is safe. This is safe. Okay. I asked my wife the other day this question: How would you like me to touch you? Where would you like me to touch you for three minutes? And I'm getting ready for like, touch me on my my bottom. Touch me. Uh, touch my breast. Touch me. She's like, you can rub my feet for three minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. But watch this. That's her spot. And the feet. There are so many nerve endings organs that, 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 that are attached to your organs. Yes, yeah, so that's relaxing <laughs> for me. That's not. And not. watch this, fellas. Because I was consistent rubbing on her spot and doing what she wanted, she gave me some soup. She opened up and she's like, okay, now I can touch you where you want to be touched. But the point in soup is once you have a safe space mm -hmm. and you're open, and you practice understanding. Right. Now they're open. Your spouse is open to receive pleasurable touch. And this is, notice that we didn't say sex. We said pleasurable touch. The end result of soup is not sex. Right. The, the end result of soup is connection. And, and when you're connected and you're touching on each other, then you, you enable your body to receive the pleasure that both of you so need and deserve. The she gets wet, you get an erection, your your, your palms get sweaty, your arms start itching, your your pupils dilate, you your heart starts beating, arousal increases, and now you're ready for some dinner. Uh, soup soup is just the appetizer. Bring me the entree. Hallelujah, glory. <laughs> I feel, so I hope this helped you guys tonight because we want to help you in this new season that we're in, and we all go through different seasons in our relationship, we want to prepare you for cold fronts. Cold fronts are going to come. You're going to have some seasons in marriage where it's a little bit more difficult than, than most other seasons. Mm -hmm. But if you practice this acronym of SOUP, I believe that you can create a space in your home where both of y'all get what you want and you're not sexually starved, but you're sexually fulfilled. Listen, we wanted uh, to tell you guys, give them, a, give them an update about our international marriage retreat. Oh, my gosh. We are so excited <laughs> that we have 39 couples, 39, 39 Woo. couples that have already secured their room and or have already paid for their room um, for our international retreat mm. on next June. And so we're excited about that. Uh, thank you guys. Yes. Uh, forthcoming uh, additional information of what we will need for you to bring or to get, make sure that your passport is up to date, but we'll be sending additional information soon. 
and and we only want to take a, a intimate group. So 40, we're thinking about cutting off at 40. So we're at 39. So could you be couple number 40? If you want to go to Jamaica and be empowered erotically and be liberated in your libido and strengthen your love and sex and learn through workshops and go on excursions and dance every night and, and go on the beach and lay out in the sun and make love on the balcony and have a wonderful time in Jamaica with us on our 30th anniversary. You got an opportunity to go and lock in your room. How do you do it? You go to drstacylspencer.com and register for this retreat and then call the resort and reserve your room. We got about one room left and we'd love for you to be couple number 40 because we're going to have the time of our lives. So you need to go to drstacylspencer.com, click on the International Retreat tab, set up your, do your registration, follow all the prompts, call the resort uh, so that you can set up, you can set up a payment plan for your room type. Uh, and we're planning on having a great time. Yes, we are. It's going to be lit, litty, litty, litty. It's going to be lit. Listen, I want you to go to Dr. Stacey L. Spencer's YouTube channel. If you have not already, like it, subscribe, and, uh, share. and share, right? Like it, subscribe, share. And then the same thing, whatever podcast platform you're on, Spotify, Apple, Google, um, whatever platform you use, go subscribe. Leave a description on how this podcast is helping your relationship. And do me a favor, share it with your friends. And also tell them about Eden Circle. Oh, Eden Circle. If you need some extra help in your marriage, because you can't do all this stuff we're saying by yourself, you need some coaches. Rhonda and I would love to walk with you through the year and help to coach you. We have monthly uh, master classes. We're going to have a meetup in December. Uh, we have quarterly meetups where we hang out with one another. You got a whole tribe of about 22 couples that meet monthly to talk about how they strengthen love and sex. If you want to be a part of our inner circle, all you got to do is go to TheEdenCircle.com, yes. TheEdenCircle.com and subscribe as a member of our inner circle so that we can walk with you all through the year. Listen, we love you guys. We hope that this is helping your marriage to be strengthened in love and sex because we don't want nobody uh -uh. to be home hungry or horny. <laughs> All right, y'all go have fun, and we'll see you on the next episode of Strengthening Love and Sex. Go and be blessed.